Okay, uh, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Richard Thompson, and I have a warehouse full of stuff in Salt Lake City that's going to be a computer graphics museum someday. And one of the big things in there, in that collection, is terminals, which is what we're going to talk about today. So before we get to terminals, let's just kind of sum up really quick uh, a brief history of electrified serial communication. So the, we start with telegraphs in the 1800s, and then we move to a teleprinter, and then a teletype. We'll, we'll get into detail on these in a second. And then those are followed by what's called a dumb glass TTY or a dumb glass teletype. And then that uh, is succeeded by discrete logic CRT terminals. And then finally, we end up with a microprocessor based terminal. So the telegraph um, it's from the Greek writing at a distance. And this is basically an electrical current transmitted over a wire that represents one of two symbols. And the, either the presence or the absence of the current indicates either a mark or space, which if you've ever looked at uh, serial communications, you might see the terms mark and space used to represent zeros and ones. And that's where we get that from because mark, the electrical current would cause a needle to write a mark on a piece of paper tape and the tape would advance. So the needle was either marking or it was making a space. Uh, symbols were transmitted as groups, or groups of symbols were transmitted to encode a glyph, which is a character in, a, in some kind of font, and the initial character encoding used for telegraph was Morse code. And the transmission speed in, in Morse code is uh, limited by the human operator. So they're always looking for a way to transmit more messages faster because uh, more messages means more money if you're running a telegraph company. Um, and then at, at the end of the telegraph period, this, this Baudo character encoding uh, was established because that's a little bit more machine friendly. Uh, and that's where we start to, to get into mechanization of the telegraph. The first thing that shows up is a teleprinter. And just for you sticklers out there, when I say first, just put giant quotation marks around it because we're just trying to summarize what the history is here. Uh, the teleprinter is basically a thing that receives the signals and is able to uh, print letters on, uh, again, on a tape. Uh, so if you've ever seen those old stock ticker machines in an old movie or whatever, that's an example of a teleprinter. It's receiving an electrical signer, signal that encodes characters you know, with marks and spaces, and then that turns into selecting a character from a font and printing it out on tape. And the input side is an operator keys in a message and prints out the uh, punches out the tape and then the tape is inserted into a reader that uh, for, for transmission so they can now send many more messages because the messages are pre-punched and you're only limited by uh, the, the transmission rate is only limited by how fast the reader can send messages into the system and then there's a machine at the other end printing them so you're not relying on a human operator to receive the Morse code or the Bado code and decode that uh, and then this is followed by a teletype where they combine the keyboard and the printer into a single mechanism. And this is more like a typewriter. Uh, it's all an electrical, um, it's electrically powered, but it's all mechanically driven. So it's basically a giant cam based machine with all these little levers and springs and all kinds of stuff that you have to oil. And it's, it's an elaborate uh, mechanism. And again, this is the Baudo encoding, which is a five bit uh, character code. So with five bits, you can represent all 26 letters in the Roman alphabet, and you can represent uh, the digits. And then to get to symbols, they would use reserve one of the codes as a shift code. So you would shift into what's called the figures portion of the Baudo code. That was another 31, um, five bits is 32 combinations. So there's another 31 codes reserved for uh, figures and symbols. And then there's a shift code that sends you back to alphabetic with so-called letters group. So there's a letters group and a figures group, and they switch back and forth with a single code from the five bits. And then we get to the dumb glass TTY. And this basically was a CRT terminal designed to replace teletypes. And the reason they're called a dumb glass TTY is because they are literally dumb. The only thing they can do on the screen is advance a line up the screen, and, and they always print whatever's coming in, well print, they always display whatever's coming in on the bottom most line. So it's literally just a scrolling glass teletype view and it's usually like only 12 lines, maybe 40 characters wide. Depends on uh, the, the, the 
ter- particular terminal, but it, they, there's no editing capability. There's no like ability to move the cursor. You can't enter text at anywhere other than the bottom. Uh, and that's the first generation of CRT terminals, and they're basically brought in to replace teletypes, which are noisy. And you know, the, if you have a room full of teletypes all going, it's like being at a rock concert. So if you replace those with screens, now we've got like an office environment. Uh, yes. Uh, so the question is, with these dumb glass teletypes, can you receive and transmit from the same machine? And and generally, yes, but some some of them were, uh, you know, display only, so they could only receive a so-called receive only uh, terminal. But most terminals are intended to be interactive, where there's a person sitting at it, like at a teletype, because a teletype is interactive too. You can type on the keyboard to transmit, mm-hmm. and then you can receive. And you, a fancy teletype would have a paper tape integrated to it, so that you could receive punch the tape and then you'd have a record of what was received and you could punch the tape locally and then transmit from the tape in order to minimize the amount of time you're spending online because you get charged by the minute. Um, So these early CRT terminals, uh, they might use a Bado code for character encoding. They might use ASCII. ASCII was first standardized in 1963, but the character encoding had existed before that. Or they might use EBCDIC if they're talking to an IBM mainframe environment. Um, And then we get into um, where things start to get more interesting for terminals. These are so-called the discrete logic terminals. So this is before microprocessors were available. Uh, These give you more control over uh, manipulating the screen. You can erase characters, insert characters, and so on. You might have multiple pages of display, so you have a larger piece of memory from which a portion is being displayed on the screen. And uh, batch uh, systems, like in in the IBM world, mainframe world, they require um, so-called bulk transmission or forms transmission. And this is where you do all the editing locally in the terminal and then you press a send key and the terminal reads out the data that you've entered and sends it to the mainframe in a batch. And this is more efficient for handling very large numbers of users, hundreds if not thousands of users simultaneously because the mainframe is not being interrupted every time you press a keystroke, right? So when you press a keystroke, it's just a local operation in the terminal. There's no communication or attention from the host that's required. And uh, that allows you to scale, for, you know, in the 60s and 70s, that allows you to scale to hundreds, if not thousands, of simultaneous users online. Um, but the interesting thing about this is that the terminal basically becomes a state machine. So uh, you can think of a state machine as just a big flow chart. Um, you know, is this char- the character that they typed? It means I need to go and do this command. Or if it's not any kind of special command character, I need to insert it into the display memory for it to be displayed on screen. If it's uh, it, generally the state machine operates the same as to whether you're typing the command locally on the keyboard or whether it's coming in from the re- uh, remote host computer. But now um, to provide any kind of functionality, and we don't yet have a microprocessor, so we have to design a custom discrete circuitry to understand all these commands and figure out what to do with the display memory based on what the command says. And then we get into a microprocessor. Uh, base terminal. This is kind of generally, I mean, microprocessors come in in the late 70s, but for terminals are really, you know, I'm just kind of rounding the the dates here for, it's really like 80s onward, every terminal is microprocessor based. And this increases the amount of smarts in the terminal like tremendously. And it also reduces the parts count by replacing a bunch of discrete chips that are implementing this complicated state machine with just a microprocessor and a memory and, um, uh, a ROM for the program code and, uh, you know, a writable memory for the display memory and any local storage that the microprocessor needs. So that reduces the cost of the terminal. And now almost anybody can make a terminal because it's not that complicated. It's a handful of chips. But the downside is that uh, the terminals start to all become the same. So from a collective perspective that starts to get less interesting, right? Because they're all basically a little tiny box designed to be as small as possible, but still hold the monitor and the circuit board that has all the smarts. And usually now the keyboard is separate because the monitor is now not big enough to hold, to hold a decent sized keyboard anymore. It's gotten so small, but they all kind of become the same looking. Uh, yes, question. Were they capable of communicating, let's say, with the IBM mainframe 
as with other uh, systems, or you will have to buy a specific terminal to connect to a specific uh, backend. Okay, so the question was, in the 80s, as these terminals got to be more of a commodity, could they communicate with any system, or did you have to buy a terminal specific to your system? It's generally broken down into two groups, the asynchronous terminals that communicated ASCII, and those is all, all basically all the non-IBM and non-IBM compatible stuff from the mainframe, air, from mainframe world. And then to talk to IBM land, it's not only a different character encoding, it's, it's typically EBCDIC and not ASCII, but it may also be a different uh, communications architecture. The IBM, a lot of IBM terminals used a synchronous a serial communication stream uh, it, that was called like SDLC or HDLC or it might be SNA depending on different terms depending on the particular um, system that it's connected into whereas the the time sharing systems the interactive systems tend to use asynchronous communication over serial lines so it's typically breaks down into IBM and IBM compatible world and the non IBM world uh, so let's just look really, before we get into the guts of some of this uh, architectural comparison, let's refer, uh, re remind ourselves, refresh ourselves on how a raster video terminal works. So you have the display memory, that's the memory chips or whatever um, uh, mechanism that's used for storage. It might be core memory, it might be a delay wire or a big shift register. It depends on the age of the terminal and what was available at the time. But you have some piece of memory that's holding the contents of the screen, and that is sent uh, is read by a video refresh circuit that is driving the CRT. And the user input goes into some kind of control logic that decides which uh, you know information to write into the display memory based on what the user is typing. Some things don't get inserted into the display memory if it's a command character that's consumed by the control logic. It doesn't go directly into the display memory. And there's some kind of communication logic, and that is interacting with the remote host computer. Um, so this video refresh is going to be uh, one of the things that is, is going to be different in the terminals we're going to look at. So let's dig into that a little bit more uh, in a little bit more detail. So in a raster monitor, every um, display it, it operates by showing you a quick succession of frames and the frames are in such rapid succession that you perceive it as just on all the time but it's actually strobing if you if you use a high-speed camera and you video a uh, CRT screen what you will see is some kind of weird interference pattern and that's because the ca the rate at which the camera is sampling the screen and the rate at which the screen is refreshing itself are not in sync and you'll see like it'll appear as like a dark bar that moves up and down the video image and that's because the video image is not on all the time it's being refreshed by this refresh logic and that involves a series of frames and each frame is indicated by a vertical synchronization pulse and there's also what's called blanking intervals so at the bottom of the image the video terminal will be blanked so that it's not displaying anything as the video beam retraces from the bottom of the screen back up to the top of the screen according to the synchronization pulse. And the same thing is happening on every scan line. So a frame consists of a series of scan lines and within each scan line the uh, electron beam is being uh, stimulated with an intensity signal and that's turning the pixels on and off. And at the end of the scan line, there's a horizontal blank where the beam is turned off for the horizontal scan line. And then there's a horizontal sync signal that brings the beam back to the beginning of the scan line. And then the next scan line is drawn and so on. So a series of scan lines make up a frame. And then a series of frames is what the display is showing you. Now in a terminal, there's an additional wrinkle that uh, the what's stored in the display memory is characters not pixels so the characters are read out of the display memory and put through what's called a character and attribute generator circuit and that turns the ascii code or the EBCDIC code for whatever character it is looks it up in a font table that's in a read-only memory and it turns that into a, a rectangular box of pixels and so the appropriate pixel for each scan line for each character is read out and sent as an intensity to uh, an intensity signal to the monitor. 
video refresh is a synchronous process. So all the computers that we deal with are all synchronous. They all have clocks that drive all the circuitry in the system. And the same is true for raster scan graphics. And the as, as these terminals, when they're you know in the 70s, getting a digital circuit that's going to operate at the frequency of individual dots coming out on the screen, that's going to be a challenging proposition because we're talking about a circuit that has to, you know, toggle quite quickly. Uh, so usually the they will figure out what is the amount of time that I need to be able to change the pixels on and off, and they'll call that the dot clock, and that ends up being the fastest clock in the whole system. So they'll take the dot clock and divide it down to get any other clocks that's used in the rest of the system. Um, and in this diagram here, I show that there's the scan line buffer feeding the character and attribute generator. Depending on the architecture of the terminal, those two blocks might be the other way around. It, de it depends on whether you do the character lookup. Um, if your scan line buffer consists of characters, then the character uh, generator is after the scan, li uh, scan line buffer. But if your scan line buffer holds pixels, then the character generator comes first. So it just depends on the terminal you look at, how they decided to break it up. Um, so like I said, it's typical to see the, the this dot clock, the pixel clock, as the fastest clock in the system, and then every other clock used by, uh, you know, if it's a microprocessor or if it's a discrete control logic, every other clock will be derived from that dot clock by dividing it down. So let's take a look at, at our first uh, terminal here. This is the Beehive B100. It's uh, probably the fanciest discrete control logic terminal that um, that there is. I mean. I haven't seen one that's more complicated, but there might be one, maybe in mainframe land. Um, but it's introduced in 1976, has a 12-inch display. 12-inch displays are actually really common for terminals. It's a good size for an 80 by 24 screen. And it, uh, a 12-inch display, I have a feeling the reason they all started uh, using this display geometry is because 12 inch display tubes were being manufactured for black and white televisions. and it, it, it made them cost effective to use the same tube. Uh, so it's an 80 by 24 character screen. The characters are five by seven dots within a seven by nine matrix. And the, the reason the matrix is larger than the character size is because it's got to have some blank space around the character. So you can, you know, if two characters are next to each other, they shouldn't be touching, right? There should be some space in between to make it legible. And there's also space between the lines. Uh, it does have advanced cursor control. So that means you can position the cursor anywhere on the screen. Uh, you can do editing operations on screen. It has protected fields, which means you can configure the screen so that there's portions of the screen that you, the user can enter data into. And then the rest of the screen is protected. So the protected areas would be the labels on a fill out form, you know, name, address, phone number, that kind of thing. And then the unprotected areas would be the data entry fields where you would enter in the information corresponding to the labels on the form. And then, um, so again, you would do all that local editing, enter in all the data into the unprotected fields and press a key and it, the terminal will then read out the unprotected portions of the screen and transmit that back to the host. Now that's a fairly complicated operation. So to do all that in discrete logic and not a microprocessor is Pretty tricky. We'll see. We'll get into the details of that in a second. So here's what the uh, main board looks like. This is the, the single circuit board that implements the entire terminal. On the bottom left there, you can see the socketed chips that represent the display memory. And then that big chip in the middle that you might think is a microprocessor is not. That is the uh, serial port universal asynchronous receiver transmitter called a UART, right? So that's the thing that takes the serial data coming in off the serial port, turns it into a parallel 8-bit uh, piece of data coming to or going to the host or coming from the host and makes that available to the rest of the terminal. And the uh, two larger chips on the, uh, to, just to the right of the memory, I believe that's either, uh, it's either the character generator or it is the uh, guts of the control logic and and then there's two uh, larger chips up at the top there 
So one of those two groups is the character generator and the other two group is the, is implementing the, the state machine. And the rest of the chips that are on there, are all the glue that uh, makes up the video refresh circuitry that makes all the um, internal uh, buses and registers of the of this complex logic, which we'll take a look at in a second. So um, here's just some of the escape codes that this terminal can receive. If uh, the chart on the right, the bold, bolder, larger letters represent the um, escape codes and this is a bit of an eye chart. You're not expected to read every single little thing in here. But the point is we have uh, cursor up, cursor down, cursor right, cursor left, clear screen, cursor position, which is we can provide some arguments to the command sequence to send the cursor to a specific location on the screen. Uh, cursor home, send the cursor to the top left corner of the screen. Page send, which is transmit everything that's in the display memory back to the host. Clear to end of screen, clear to end of line, delete character, turn on and off, insert mode. So if we're in insert mode, it means any characters being received, either from the keyboard or from the host, are going to push all the other characters down in display memory. So that's a fairly complicated operation. We've got to move a bunch of stuff around for every inserted characters. Uh, format mode, on and off, that's how you program the fill-in form for the protected regions and the unprotected regions after you've uh, configured the fields you turn format mode on and then all input is restricted to the unprotected areas of the screen uh, start field and end field that's how you configure which portions of the screen are protected yes is this for a specific terminal type this is for the b the beehive b100 specifically uh the question was is, is this for a specific terminal type um, and then you can enable or disable the keyboard. You can uh, send the line that the cursor is on back to the host. And then you can configure which portions of the screen blink. So we've got blink, protected fields, editing. There's a lot going on in this terminal in terms of the functionality. But there's, again, no, no microprocessor. So from looking at those escape codes, we can see that... Um, there's certain things that are implied to exist inside this big state machine that implements all the, the control of this terminal. So we've got cursor position has to be maintained somewhere because we can send it around and we, ha we, we know where the cursor is. Has to, it has to know where the cursor is in order to display the location of the cursor, obviously, on this, and video refresh. Uh, page and line send implies that we got to have some kind of logic to scan out portions of the display memory and send them to the COM port. Clear to end of screen or end of line implies that we're going to have some kind of counters that are going to count positions as we clear portions of the display memory. We have to know when to stop. Uh, the insert mode implies moving blocks of data around in the display memory. Start and end blink implies that there's a blink attribute that has got to be stored somewhere for each character that's displayable. And same thing for uh, these protected fields. There's got to be some kind of attribute stored that indicates whether or not that position in display memory is protected or not. Uh, and all these control functions can be typed locally on the keyboard or they can be received uh, from the host. So here's, um, don't try and read anything on this diagram. It's a, it's a one bit scan and we're gonna go and show you the details in a second. But just to give you an idea, this is the overall block diagram of this terminal. And all of the, this is showing basically the data flow between the different functional blocks. And um, so let's let's dig into it a little bit now. I've I've kind of you know overlaid you know some text on top of the block diagram here to make it a little more more legible. So, but as I was saying earlier, uh, this machine starts with a crystal oscillator that provides the highest frequency clock, and then that clock is divided down by seven to get a dot position clock. And then that's divided down a further 96 to get a character position clock. And then that's divided further down to get by nine to get a character height clock. And then that's divided even further by 29 to get a character line clock. Now, what, why are these numbers so weird? Why is it? Well, the by seven, that's kind of not too hard to figure out because seven is the width of um, the, the, the character cell. Actually, actually, I think this divide by seven is just due to the, the master oscillator clock frequency that they've chosen. But 96, why 96? Well, we're going to display 80 characters on the screen. But as I mentioned, there's horizontal refresh. So 
there's, I mean, the beam has to keep moving after the characters are done displaying. So there's a certain number of character positions at the end that are allocated for horizontal blank and for horizontal uh, refresh or um, horizontal sync. And then there's a certain number of character positions reserved at the front so that when we start drawing the next character, it's not immediately at the far left end of the tube, which depending on how the tube is adjusted, it may not even be visible. So there's a certain amount of blank space allocated at the front and the back. And if you look at uh, data sheets and so on, you, sometimes you see this referred to as the front porch and the back porch. But that's why it's divided by 96, because it's 80 characters that are going to be displayed, and then there's 16 characters that are divided up to account for the blanking interval at the, at the end and the front. Um, character height divided by 9, that's because our character cell is 7 by 9. So there's 9 scan lines within each um, character matrix, right? And the 29, again, it's really 24 lines are going to be visible on screen, but we're going to have some lines allocated for the blanking interval at the end, the vertical blanking interval at the end, and a little space on the top so that when we start drawing the text, it doesn't appear right at the very top of the monitor. Uh, this, the, these clocks are also used to generate the um, baud rate clock for um, transmission back to the host. Um, and the communication section here, you basically just have that this terminal, it has a, an auxiliary port to which you would usually attach a printer. So there's basically like a, a print screen command that can send the entire contents of the screen to the auxiliary port for a hard copy if you, if you need a hard copy. Uh, but most of the time, it's the main port that is in use. And we have a receiver UART that receives serial data from the host, turns that into a parallel byte stream, and that goes into a, an input buffer. And then we have a, a, a UART transmitter section, which takes parallel data from this discrete control logic and turns it into a serial bit stream that's sent back out the host over the asynchronous serial port. Uh, for display refresh, we have um, basically an implementation of what I described to you generically earlier. We have the display memory, which has uh, seven bits because we're uh, not going to store control codes directly into uh, the display memory. We're, you know, we're not going to store character codes larger than 127. So it's seven bit ASCII. So uh, this remember, this is the 1970s. Bits are precious. So we're only going to store seven bits per character. Uh, and it's 1920. And if you, it, if you multiply it out, 1920 is 80 by 24. So it's just enough memory to, to store what's being displayed and no more. Uh, and then there's one bit to represent the protected attribute of every character on the screen. And there's one bit to represent the blink attribute. Uh, the Here they've got the display memory goes into the character generator, and then the character generator feeds that video shift register. So it's as I was saying before, sometimes they have the character generator first, and the scan line register is holding pixels, which is the case here. That all... that. Uh, Pixel data gets combined with the protect bit and the blink bit to go into a circuit that computes the video intensity, and then that goes out to drive the uh, the internal monitor. And there's also a, an RS-170 jack on the back of this terminal, so you can capture the video signal that's being uh, a video signal version of what's being displayed on the terminal. So you can send it to an external monitor, or you could send it to some kind of recording device or what have you. Okay, so this is the part that is, is the most interesting. This is the block diagram of this control logic, and it's implemented as a giant programmable logic array. A programmable logic array is just a lookup table. So there's inputs that come in, that selects some entry in the table, and then however wide the table is represents the data that comes out of it. So you have an address, and you look up a data word, and the data word is interpreted as an instruction. So that big, big block there on the left is the programmable logic array. It has a sequence input. This is a counter. It's like the program counter on a microprocessor. So as the machine, as this state machine is advancing through a sequence of operations, that sequence counter will be increasing. Uh, there's this mode input. There's um, uh, further uh, 
this this PLA input selection mode block on the far left, that thing is receiving a bunch of other inputs and decoding them into a sequence of signals that are feeding the the logic array lookup. So it's kind of on the left side is a kind of more human convenient way of thinking of what is going to be going into this machine. And then it's it, that's further compressed into a sequence in, into a smaller number of selected uh, values that go directly into the logic array for looking up the instruction. So what comes out of that logic array is some kind of command that goes into a decoder. And then the decoder is controlling all these different registers saying whether or not is this register going to be read or is it going to be written or is it going to be ignored or is it, you know, not changed. So we have a register for the cursor position. We have a buffered backup set of the cursor position registers that's uh, in the center uh, bottom there. We, we have a roll counter that the roll counter is used to uh, do things like when I um, on, on a CRT, when I get to the, when I'm sending, receiving input from the host and I get, you know, fills from the top down and then we get down to the last line, what has to happen is all the display memory has to be shifted up one line. So that roll counter is used to, to count, you know, where we are in that process. And then there's a, a sequence counter and an operation register. If, if you don't understand the details here, that's not important. The point is, They've created an abstract machine that represents the operations that are necessary to achieve all the functionality in this terminal. They don't have a microprocessor. They've created a custom machine with custom registers, custom instructions, and custom counters, and they implement that specific functionality for the terminal and nothing else. And if you wanted to know, like, what is the program that is driving this thing? What's, uh, yes, this question over here. any 7-bit asynchronous ASCII machine and and the, your question of embedded in your question so the question was what what computer system would you be using with this terminal this terminal is a 7-bit ASCII terminal communicates over asynchronous RS-232 so you hook it up to a modem and on the other end would be a time sharing machine typical of the 70s like a PDP-1170 or something like that and if you wanted to take advantage of the functionality in this terminal like say you were writing a basic plus program on Ristis on a PDP 11, you're writing print statements and you're printing out the escape codes, send an escape character, then send a B that does cursor up or cursor left or whatever uh, the particular function is. The escape codes are documented in the manual that comes with your terminal. So you're just writing print statements that's transmitting escape codes to the terminal to give it commands to tell it what to do. Uh, anybody here ever use Emacs? Okay, so brief digression. Emacs started as editor macros for an editor called Tico. And Emacs is basically a fancy set of commands that turn a, an abstract instruction like, you know, move to this point in the edit buffer. It turns that into a sequence of escape codes that are transmitted to the terminal to have the terminal perform that operation. So the, the, that's kind of a long-winded answer. The short-winded answer is... You would look at the documentation for the terminal, learn what the escape code functionality is, and then you'd write print statements to send those escape codes to the terminal to get it to do what you want. Right. User software level support rather than operating system level Correct. Uh, the, the comment was that it's user level support instead of operating system level support. Yeah, I'm not aware of any... Is there any operating system today that understands the terminal directly? Probably more in IBM mainframe land where you've got 3270 connection protocol that understands like, you know, screen layouts and stuff like that. Yes. I think Putty might actually have some settings for that. I could you, sorry. I think Putty might actually have some settings for that. Uh, Putty, yeah. So the question, the, the statement was that Putty might have some settings. So this Putty has basically a terminal emulator built into it. It'll emulate a VT100, which will look at briefly and I think you had some yeah I was thinking like uh, just to clarify yeah you can probably connect this up to an RS-232 of a Linux box and then as long as you have the term cap of the terminal you could probably use it directly with a modern so the, the statement was that if you had the right term cap database setting for Linux you could just connect this to an RS-232 serial port and the answer is yes yeah. 
and there is a Beehive B100 terminal ca term cap entry already set. You have to make sure you go get the historical term cap database full of obsolete stuff that nobody yeah. uses anymore, but yes. Uh, and then you would you could just use VI. VI goes through a library that turns an abstract operation like, you know, go move the cursor to this location, turns that into a sequence of escape codes with the right parameters, and then the cursor appears on the screen at that, at that location. Uh, okay, yes, over here. Yeah. <clears throat> the escape characters that are used in ANSI C, are they compatible with this terminal? I mean, I don't have any idea. It's way before my time. So we'll, uh, I'm going to ask you to hold that, okay. hold, hold for the answer. The question was, you know, does uh, C, uh, the standard IO library in C, how would you do interact with the terminal here? And the answer is you, it's, you're just doing printf to send bytes to the terminal is the short answer. Right. Kind of in there, you mentioned ANSI C and there are ANSI escape sequences that are standardized, and we haven't gotten there yet because that that hasn't happened yet in in terms of the timeline. We're we're, we're pre ANSI escape codes uh, right here. Uh, so just go back to the escape code chart here. These command codes are specific to this terminal and only this terminal. And anybody else that wants to pretend they are this terminal would have to understand these escape codes. Yes. I'm assuming the terminal could also do the, the ASCII control, so control G would make a bell and control A could back. Yes, I, I, I haven't shown every single possible function that this terminal can do, but you know, just the, the you know, cause yeah. we, need, we need to monitor time here. So, okay. Um, but this little eye chart here, again, not intended for you to read this, but the point is this is the program logic that implements all the functions in this uh, terminal, and it, that's the, the full two pages worth. We'll look briefly at a little bit. Um, it's hard to read these little boxes, but basically we start from the idle state in the top left here, and then it's basically saying, is there a null in the command buffer? And if there is, that means we haven't received any kind of character yet, so there's nothing to do. So just keep looping back until we get some kind of character. And then it starts asking itself questions about what is the character that we received? Is it a delete character? Is it a, a carriage return character? Is it a line feed character? Is it a backspace character? Carriage return, line feed, backspace. These are all, they're not escape sequences, but they're all character codes that influence the position of the cursor. So if I received a carriage return, I'm supposed to send the cursor to the beginning of the line. And that's why if it says, if it's a CR code, then the, um, it clears the cursor position. So that's the position of the cursor within the current line. So if I receive carriage return, clear the character position, <laughs> the cursor position register, because now we want the cursor to go back to the beginning of the line. Now notice it just clears the register. It doesn't have to do anything else because the video refresh circuitry takes place uh, or takes care of displaying the cursor on the screen. So all we have to do is clear the register and then the video refresh circuitry consults the register to know where to display the cursor in the bitstream that goes to the to the display. Same thing for line code or, or for line feed code. It looks to see if um, well, you increment the current line position of the cursor, and then that next decision box down there. I don't know if you can read it, but it says cursor illegal. So this is the terminal's way of saying I advanced the cursor down one line, but I was already at the bottom line of the display. So once I advance one more, now the cursor is in an illegal position and that means we need to do something to, to get things back into proper order. And for the case of line feed, that's gonna mean we have to push all the display lines up one, create a blank line in display memory at the bottom, and then we can position, we can decrement the cursor position counter or the cursor line position one more to get it back into a legal position. It's a little different if we advance the cursor off the end of the line. Uh, it still ends up in a legal state, but it, it does a different adjustment. A anyway, you, you can you can find this flow chart in the, uh, the the manual for this terminal, so you can read the whole the full detail of what it of what it does. But just to give you an idea of like you know this is a pretty complicated machine for no microprocessor. Even if I were to write this up in a assembly language in a microprocessor, it would be a significant amount of work, right? Because there's a lot of functionality in here. Okay, so 
let's get on to the, the you know the next evolution here, which is a, a terminal with a microprocessor in it. So the the Digital Equipment Corporation VT100. This it uses a microprocessor for all the control functions. It still has other discrete circuitry in it, which we'll look at in a second. And um, there, again, I'm going to put asterisks anytime around anytime I say the word first or any kind of date. But uh, the VT100 was the first widely popular terminal to implement ANSI escape sequences. So prior to this, all these ter terminal manufacturers, they'd all been implementing their own escape codes for their, all, for their own commands. And there's some consistency, but they're all just different enough that you can't take a single piece of software and have it work on all the terminals. So the idea was, if they get together and standardize a bunch of escape codes through ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, then we just write one piece of software and it'll work on all the terminals as long as they're ANSI compliant. So that was the idea behind the VT100. 12-inch um, display, it can display either 80 or 132 characters on 24 lines. And there's some you know, fiddle faddling here because, you know, some of those combinations can only achieve, be achieved with a piece of add-on hardware, which we'll see in a second. Use the seven by nine character matrix. It has blink. So the, the beehive had blink, but this also has bold and reverse video and underline. So those were not, that, that was an advancement. You know, the beehive did not have that. Um, you may not have heard of it's, brief digression here. You may not have heard of Beehive itself, but if you're a Chrome Memco collector, the Chrome Memco terminal is actually a Beehive B100. They just rebranded re it. It's actually made by Beehive and has a Chrome Memco label on it. Uh, Beehive did that a lot. They made a lot of terminals in the 1970s, many, many thousands, but a lot of them were branded under the names of other companies. So you kind of get to recognize them by how they look and not what the label is. Um, but the, the uh, VT100 has an 8080 CPU in it, and it supports many ANSI uh, sequences. If you go and look at the current ANSI um, standard control sequence documentation, they have tons of functionality in there now. The, the VT100 supports the main common ones for screen cursor positioning and screen editing. Uh, there's also some deck specific sequences in there um, for some features in the VT100 that because of VT100 itself was so popular, many people emulate those uh, deck specific sequences. Uh, mainly it's things like the double wide, double high characters and stuff like that. That's deck specific. That's not ANSI. But an interesting thing about the VT100 is that it has some hardware expansion ports. Uh, here's the main logic board of the VT100. And... The CPU is the tall, uh, large chip in the bottom there. And to just to the left of that are the four EEPROM chips that represent the uh, read-only memory storage for the firmware. And then the rest of the circuitry on there is the, 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 the big chip in the upper left. That's the, your UART, your universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. And then the rest of the chips on there implement the display memory and whatever other logic that they need in order to uh, generate the video signals. And for the VT100, here's just a sampling of um, the escape codes. The, these are the ANSI escape codes. And you see that they're, they're similar to what we had with the Beehive. You got cursor up, cursor down, cursor right, cursor left, cursor position. So that takes parameters, sends the cursor to a specific position. You've got erase and display, erase and line, device attributes, and so on. And I'm getting a little short on time here, so I'm going to speed things up. So... Um, the VT100, you've, you've basically got the main board. You've got some uh, connectors on there. This little box with the advanced video option is the hardware expansion. It gives you 132 characters per line and gives you some additional attributes and additional display memory. Uh, current loop adapter <coughs> options. So you can talk to a system expecting to see a teletype as, a, as opposed to expecting to see an RS-232 uh, style serial port. Uh, can talk to the LEDs on the keyboard and receive input from the keyboard. Um, Inside, um, again, just a, a high-level block diagram view. The the little blocks that are in that are shaded there, those actually actually represent functions that are implemented in the firmware software that is on uh, that is running on the microprocessor. Um, and 
you know, here's a more detailed data flow style diagram like we saw for the beehive of, you know, how things are moving around between the different components inside the VT100. But if we want to look similar at what we saw before, um, we've got a chunk of circuitry for host communication that is talking to the serial port. We've got a chunk of circuitry that is for the user input, it's talking to the keyboard. We've got the CPU and the firmware control, that's the all the smarts. And we've got a, you know, a little chunk of display memory. Now, there's a significantly less amount of uh, chips and circuitry dedicated to control because we've put all that control smarts into the firmware instead of having it be a discrete circuit. Um, we've still got a scanline buffer and a character attribute generator that's going to um, a chip that's doing a clock generation. And uh, I'm gonna, again, to kind of accelerate things for time here, but it's the same thing. There's a master clock that goes into a bunch of dividers that's dividing down to, to compute the other clocks that are driving things like, what line are we on? What character are we in within the line? And then what scan line within each character are we? Um, and there's a video timing refresh, which is generating those uh, horizontal blank and vertical blank and horizontal sync and vertical sync, generating all the signals to control the monitor. That's all very typical and standard. So the more interesting part of the VT100 is that it's hardware expandable. And we have the advanced video option connector. We have a standard terminal port connector. We have a graphics connector. And this whole thing, the main board sits inside a card cage. So here's where those connectors are on that board. The graphics connector is a, like a 18 pin dip style connector in the upper left. This STP port thing, it looks kind of goofy, but it, it, it's, it, we'll talk about why it is that way in a second. The advanced video option is this pin header in the middle. And then the bottom right, you can see there's an edge connector there where this board connects into a card cage. So the advanced video option is probably the one that, um, was most widely used and that's it provides more display memory so now we can have 132 columns per line at 24 lines and you might say like why is 132 columns important and the answer is because a lot of printers from this era they had 132 characters per printed line and that was so they could print out but this gets before spreadsheets and things like that but if you want to print out accounting ledgers it was very common to have rows with many columns and lots of uh you know financial data in each column so to get more information on a page they had the wider um print format of 132 characters per line so if you're printing that way you probably want to see it that way on the screen as well so with the advanced video option it can display 132 characters by 24 lines the advanced video option provides more attribute memory. So some of those attributes like blink and underline, sorry, uh, I believe it was reverse video and underline. Those are only available with the advanced video option. It also provided more ROM sockets on this little daughter board that's attached to the main board so that you could have additional custom program code in the V200 if you wanted to go that crazy. Most people didn't, they just bought it for the additional display memory and the attributes. Uh, the standard terminal port this is a way for an add-on peripheral for your VT100 to snoop the serial data stream that's going to and from the host. So this board sits between the host and the terminal. It can then receive characters coming in on the host stream and then do whatever it wants with them and not send them on to the terminal. Or it can say, oh, this is a sequence I don't know anything about, so it just forwards it on. So it's kind of a way to get uh, I guess you could build a keystroke logger with this. I, I don't know, but I don't know anybody who did that. But usually it's for things like you have an attached printer and there are command sequences that are intended for the printer and not for the terminal. So the printer uh, in interposes itself, receives those codes, sends stuff to the printer instead of sending it to the terminal. Uh, the graphics connector is kind of uh, interesting. And this gives you a way to directly access the digital video signal of the pixels that are going to be sent to the monitor of the VT100 itself. And usually, because it's just that little dip connector, uh, usually you have like a ribbon cable that goes from that connector to a separate board that plugs into the card cage. And this will give you things like the ability to have a printer that will, uh, you know, 
grab the pixels off the screen and print it from that as opposed to printing from a command stream uh, that's coming from the host. The card cage itself is basically just a way to supply power to the board. There's no way for you to communicate with the terminal through the card cage connector. But there's an extra slot in there. So if you need a, a lot of functionality, you take the extra slot, get the power off the card cage, and then attach yourself to the advanced video option connector or the graphics connector. Okay, so the final terminal we're going to look at is is a it's actually a family of terminals, but we're going to look spe more specifically at the 2648. This is from Hewlett Packard. Um, this is a, a range of terminals introduced between 75 and 81. They have a five by 10 inch display, so that's kind of weird, but it, it gives you very nice, crisp characters in a landscape format. Uh, it's microprocessor controlled. It can have tape drives for local storage. One of the variants in here, the 2647, has BASIC and ROM, and it has um, bitmapped graphics on the display. So BASIC and ROM, bitmapped graphics, tape drives for storage, starts to sound like a personal computer. Um, and it's organized like a personal computer. This terminal, this series family of terminals, is implemented as a card cage into which you insert cards. Um, it has a huge repertoire of escape sequences for everything from tape drive control, keyboard control, graphics commands, graphics attributes, tons of stuff. There was a, there's an escape sequence you can send to it to say, uh, configure automatic plotting of the next group of data that you're going to receive, and then just numbers separated by spaces and carriage returns to uh, separate rows of numbers start coming in from the host, and it just takes that data and interprets it as a as a plot. So lots of smarts, lots of uh, escape codes in this thing. This is only a small smattering of them. We're not going to drill into it. One other interesting thing is it does have Tektronix 4010, 4014 emulation. So this can emulate another popular graphics terminal. Uh, and as terminals go on, that starts to become a popular thing, terminals emulating other terminals. Yeah. Did it also emulate the HP GL plot? Uh, plot uh, uh, the question was, did it implement HP GL plot language, which was for the plotters? And the answer is the escape codes are similar, but not identical. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> But here you can just see this just, you know, just giving you an idea of this whole system is designed as a card cage in which you stick boards to implement the various functionality. So if you just need character display, you just put a character display board set in there. If you need a graphics display, then you put the graphics display uh, set of boards in, in there. And there's a, um, a board that implements uh, the keyboard interface, there's a, uh, a board that implements the CPU, there's a board that implements the interface to the tape drives, and so on. So uh, the whole thing is just a big modular system, and different terminals in this family of terminals, it's just a matter of which boards are plugged in and how they're connected. Uh, so as I said, like, you know, CPU card, a memory card, a display card, a graphics display card, a keyboard <coughs> interface card, host communication interface card, tape interface card, Additional slots are even open if you want to put your own custom board in there. Um, and a bunch of different terminals came from this from this single uh, design. And by 81, they'd shipped 60,000 of these things. And that's a lot for HP, considering how much they charge for the stuff that they make. 60,000 units is a lot. So that... that HP terminal that we looked at, this last one, I mean, that really starts to look like a personal computer. And, you know, is it a personal computer or is it a terminal? Yes. Uh, is the bus similar or was it at the time like uh, S50 and S100 buses? Okay, so the question is, is the is the bus any kind of standard? And the answer is no. Right. It, it's a complete specific HP design. And you might notice, if you look at this picture, you'll see that there's a, connector on the top connecting some of these boards across the top and if we look at this diagram of the cards you'll see that some of these cards have a little a little line across the top connecting separate cards together and that's because they have the basic address data but address data and control lines on the basic bus in the card cage but then in order to achieve enough bandwidth between other cards for certain functions they have a little top board connector that connects the cards together so for instance, the graphics display needs extra, um, 
they couldn't fit the entire graphics display onto a single board. So it's split between multiple boards and those boards have to communicate it to each other. And because it's a bitmap graphics display, the bandwidth has to be higher than what is on the card cage. So they have a special connector across the top that allows the display controller to talk to the display memory. And then I think the third board in this in the set is the is the interface to the the main bus that's used in the system. So I'm I'm getting the the wrap up single here, which is good because we're all the way at the end. So is it a personal computer or is it a terminal? And if it's a personal computer, we expect to be able to program it. That's not a typical expectation of a terminal. It's possible terminals did offer it, but typically not. On a personal computer, uh, a serial port might be considered an option, depends on the era, but um, that's certainly going to be required on a terminal. This terminal isn't going to be able to do anything if we can't talk to a host computer with it. Uh, on a personal computer, it's expected that you're going to be able to store things locally in non-volatile memory, whether that's a floppy disk or a cassette drive or what have you. That's going to be considered an optional thing on a terminal. You might ask, why would I need local storage on a terminal? And the answer is, it always comes down to the time you're connected to the host computer you're being charged for. So people would enter all their data locally on the terminal, store it on a floppy disk or what have you, and then connect up to the host computer late at night when the rates are cheap, and then upload the data from the floppy and you know not have to be there typing at it for an hour at a time, whatever. Get it done in a couple of minutes. Um, on a personal computer, a uh, character display is expected, and it is expected on a terminal as well. But on a personal computer, depending on what kind of personal computer it is, like on an S100 style personal computer, graphics was a fancy option that you paid a lot of money for if you get like a Chromemco Dazzler card or something like that. Whereas on a Commodore 64, that's just kind of expected. Like, why would I buy a Commodore 64 if it doesn't have graphics? I want to play games. That's the whole reason I bought this thing. But graphics on a terminal could be considered an optional thing. A lot of it, terminals are used in a lot of business cases, so like they didn't need graphics, so that might be an option. Um, and on a personal computer, you know, if, if if you buy one, that's nice to you. It has expansion, right? So it's got like an Apple II has the expansion bus, and you can put in peripheral cards. IBM PC is the internal buses where you can put in expansion cards. You can connect peripherals up to the serial ports and the parallel ports. It, adding on to your personal computer is an expected thing, but that's not a typically expected thing on a terminal. So they're very similar in a lot of ways, but they're also different in some ways. And it just it's just they're different because of the markets that they were going after when they created these products. Now, if you want to learn more about terminals, uh, I have an ongoing project here. I've created this, this thing called the Terminals Wiki. Usually if you Google for information about a terminal, you'll end up on the wiki anyway, because it's where all, all the uh, information has been collected in one place. Um, you can find terminals by manufacturer or by the year that they were introduced, and you can find links to documentation, technical manuals and stuff like that. All the technical diagrams I've shown you are, are linked through the wiki. You can find them. Uh, you can find pictures too, which is helpful if you're like, I don't know what this terminal is, but I can read like the brand name and I can go browse by manufacturer, look at the, <laughs> the pictures for that manufacturer and maybe find out what kind of terminal you have. It's a wiki, so contributions are welcome from anyone and you can, doesn't cost anything. So that's it. That's what we have.